Good evening or good morning, depending on when you're viewing this. We're back at our Bible study in the book of Revelation. And so last time we looked at chapter 7, and today we're going to look at chapter 8. Now, Revelation has this different structure to it, where sometimes it will say something, and then it will almost go back and repeat the same thing, but with slightly different language, with a little bit of a different... Uh, feel to it. And it almost reminds me of, uh, if you ever listen to jazz music, sometimes jazz music will do this, where it will repeat itself. There'll be a, a sort of theme where it will repeat, but it might be in a different key, or it might be that the lead instrument is different, right? You know, maybe, you know, the piano was leading before, and now the trumpet's going to take uh, a main place. And so it's sort of the same musical idea, but it's just expressed a little bit differently. And I think this is so that uh, one of my professors at seminary said that when you study the Bible, it's like studying a gemstone or a diamond. And when you hold it up before the light, you can see all of the reflections of the light in all of these variety of ways, and it's really intriguing. And sometimes all you have to do is turn it a tiny bit, and you just turn it a little bit, and then suddenly there's all these new sparkles, all of these new lights. And so that's what we're going to do as we read chapter 8 today. It's going to be a different vision of John, but a lot of it is going to sound familiar like the stuff we've already talked about. But as always, when we study the scripture, and especially when we get into the book of Revelation, we ought to open with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we open up your word today to look at the book of Revelation, we pray that you would enlighten our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit so that what we would interpret would be in line with the rest of the scriptures and with what we know of our Savior and his gospel. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, the book of Revelation, I think I mentioned this at the beginning of the study, it's been called an anti-legumina uh, in the church. It's it's one that was spoken against, and, and I, there were pastors in the early church, uh, and even up to, I want to say, the 19th century, there were Lutheran pastors who wouldn't preach on it, um, because they said they simply don't understand it. And I have to say that... Uh, I, I hope that I understand it, but I might be closer to that end of the spectrum than someone who might say they're an expert at Revelation. Uh, but we'll, we'll begin with chapter 8, verse 1. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden, golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the angel of God. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake." All right, we have a lot to unpack in this little section so far. So first of all, when the Lamb opened. So who is the Lamb in Revelations? Uh, Revelation? Uh, it is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. John the Baptist pointed uh, and proclaimed that uh, about Jesus. And so we know that the Lamb means Jesus. And we talked before about how uh, St. John might be using this language of Lamb uh, to, to try and kind of... Uh, code the message a bit, but also to give us this imagery, right? That Jesus is the Lamb of God. There's this whole tradition all through the Old Testament uh, of the imagery of the Lamb and what that means, but this is a different Lamb, and this is our tension with the person of Jesus as, as we understand him. Uh, Jesus is a Lamb, but he's also strong, and no one else is able to open the seal except for the Lamb, right? And so we think of Jesus as the lamb, as the good shepherd, but we also have to think of him as the warrior, right? As the one in in uh, chapter one who is there with these fiery eyes and he's strong and uh, his feet are like brass and, and you know, people fall before him as though dead because they're so terrified of him. Uh, and so there's both wrapped into one, right? So Jesus is strong, uh, but he's also uh, the lamb. He is also gracious. He is also gentle with his people. Uh, and so that's that's all wrapped up in that first verse about the seventh seal. And so uh, the opening of the seventh seal, it's again this sense of, of opening the letter of judgment. What is, what is pronounced there? 
Uh, and there was silence in heaven. Everyone is awed. Everyone is amazed uh, for about half an hour. Uh, then I saw seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. So again, now we're, we're dealing with the imagery. Now we're dealing with a vision of trumpets, right? So we were dealing with seals, but now we're dealing with trumpets, right? And so a lot of commentators will say, well, this is really a re repetition of what we've already seen in the judgments. Uh, but instead of seals this time, it's almost like now, like jazz music, we've switched to the trumpets now. Uh, and so it's going to be the seven trumpets. And a lot of the description is going to be kind of similar, but there might be a little bit of nuance here. Uh, and so the seven trumpets are going to be played. And now it's probably the most controversial passage in this chapter, maybe one of the most controversial passages uh, in the history of the church. Uh, this imagery of the saints at the altar, or the angel at the altar uh, with the saints and their prayers. There's an old uh, prayer in the, the Latin rite mass, and I think it, it might even be in the Greek church, uh, and it's something to the effect of uh, let this let your angel bring the saints the the prayers of your people to your altar in heaven and et cetera et cetera et cetera and that's based on this text uh, and if you've ever wondered if if you've never been in, in if you're not familiar with the Roman Catholic tradition or the Eastern Orthodox tradition people might ask well why do they ask why do they pray to the saints uh, and what they're doing is asking the saints to pray for them and it's based on this passage here. Uh, it's based on this understanding uh, that in Revelation you have the lamb and he's on the throne and there's the altar uh, and then there's all the saints around him, all of the people who've died in the faith. Uh, and so they're praying and their prayers are coming before God like incense and it's it's having an effect. And so people would say, well, you know, I could pray down here in Saskatchewan, uh, but, you know, St. Bartholomew is up there. He's only like 10 feet from Jesus. And so if I can get St. Bartholomew to bring his prayer prayer to Jesus, uh, then, you know, I'll really have a, a better chance than just praying down here. And so that's kind of the logic. And the, that, that might be a bit of a caricature or an oversimplification, but that's sort of what we get in the text uh, in, in their perspective. Um, I once thought that that was the case, but the more I read this text, the less convinced I am of that. Uh, the, the Lutheran confessions take this interesting middle ground uh, where they say, well, even if the saints in heaven are praying for us, we're never taught to go to the saints for prayer. Uh, and so, and we're not really given an assurance that, that praying to St. Bartholomew would actually work. Um, and so it's really a first commandment issue of who are we to fear, love, and trust in? Who are we to pray, praise, and give thanks to? And it's God Almighty. He is the one. And so uh, it's it's a little bit different. Uh, there are some who would simply say, no, you can't pray to the saints. It doesn't work. It's foolish. Uh, and that may be the case. Um, and then the, there's others who say, no, no, you, you ought to pray to the saints. They're closer to God. See, it says in Revelation, the saints are there. Uh, and then the Lutheran church takes kind of a middle position where they say, you know, we're never really encouraged to do this. And there's a whole lot of speculation that's going on uh, to, to make this work. There's a whole lot of kind of unseen question mark parts to this argument that, that doesn't really make sense. Uh, and the reason why I don't think that this is the case, I don't think uh, we're called to, to ask the saints for their prayers, the intercession of the saints. I mean, we can ask the living saints in our church for prayers. But I think the reason here is look at what happens in this passage. You know, it's people are all debating about this verse. Look at what happens when the, the prayers of the saints are gathered, right? So they gather before the Lord as incense. This is, again, a, a justification people use for having incense in church. Uh, and so the prayers of the saints come before the Lord. And then the angel takes the censer and he fills it with fire from the altar and he throws it to the earth. Uh, and what happens on the earth? Well, there's thunder, there's rumblings, there's flashes of lightning, and there's an earthquake. Uh, and we're right about to hear about horrible stuff happening on earth. And I'll give you just a preview. Let's go on a bit. Uh, verse six. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow, the first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all green grass was burned up. 
The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. All right, so if what are, what is, what are the saints praying for? The destruction of a sinful world, right? Uh, the judgment of God uh, upon those who, you know, attacked and martyred them. Uh, and so, or at least that seems to be the cause and effect, right? You know, the, the saints are praying, and then what happens? Judgment. And I think that's probably not what most people are going to St. Bartholomew for, right? Uh, there's not a lot of people who are on earth praying, man, if only God's judgment could get here quicker. Uh, you know, I bet if I went to the saints, they could bring some real wrath uh, to the earth. And yet that's the image here. So be careful. My, my wrapping up of this whole issue is be careful when you take a small verse or a small idea in the scriptures and make a huge church-wide practice about it, make sure that you really understand what the context is, uh, because it's not a, it's a good text, a good context in the sense of God's justice is good, but it's not good for you and me, because we might be on one of those boats, or, or someone we love might be a part of, of the destruction that, that's happening there, so uh, I don't think that this is a great text, uh, all that to say, I don't think this is a good text to say. Uh, that we should be praying to the saints um, or asking for the saints' prayers. All right, uh, that issue wrapped up. Uh, so the, we're getting into the judgments again. So now we have the, the seven trumpets being played. Uh, we have the judgments coming out, and, and we have uh, all of this hail and fire and blood. Uh, and what exactly does that mean? I, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I can't really sit here and say, well, it makes scientific sense for there to be hail with blood. Some people try and do things like that with the Bible. I think this is poetic imagery of just, this is the terror, right? There's going to be hail. There's going to be fire. There's going to be blood. It's going to be bad. Uh, it's, it's using a hy hyperbole to just tell us about how bad things are going to be at the judgment, uh, about how trees are going to be burned up, grass is going to be burned up, the sea is going to be destroyed, all of these things, uh, it's going to be really, really bad. Uh, and so that's the, the first two trumpets. Uh, verse 10, the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became wormwood, and many people died be from the water because it had been made bitter. All right, what on earth does that mean? Uh, commentators again point out that, uh, well, anytime a star falls from heaven, that should remind us of, you know, the the uh, the fall of Satan from heaven because stars are sometimes linked to angels. But Satan's gonna fall. But Satan already fell from heaven, so. What is this wormwood star? And then wormwood is like this bitter plant that basically uh, it makes a bitter extract. And so then there's going to be bitter water that's going to kill people. I mean, we know all about water pollution and uh, uh, all of the microplastics that have damaged our systems that are in the water cycle. So, I mean, there's all sorts of things that this could... Uh, mean, I don't know, but the imagery there of Wormwood, I can't decode that for you. Uh, maybe you know something I don't. Uh, but what is the end result? Again, let's let's focus on the big picture. The big picture here uh, is that God's people in heaven are praying for, for judgment. They're praying for Jesus to come. And before Jesus can come, there is judgment on the earth for sin. There is judgment uh, and there is this destruction at the last day. And so uh, before that, there's destruction in the ecosystem and the human society and nature as well. Uh, and there is this destruction of water sources, uh, which are so critical. All right, let's keep going on. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Then I looked and heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead, Woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. All right, so we have this very, very, I, I can't even begin to describe how difficult this is to explain. How can a third of the sun 
be removed? Or does that just mean daylight hours? Does that mean that there's like smog so that you can't even, uh, there's a haze, you know, there's a, a po post-apocalyptic book uh, that I quite enjoy by Cormac McCarthy called The Road. And it talks about how, you know, after these nuclear blasts, all the dust is so much in the air that you only get a few hours of sunlight. Maybe it's something like that. I don't know. Uh, but basically, it's bad. That's the whole point, right? What is the, the, and who is the eagle? I don't know. But what is the eagle cry? Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. Uh, so it's bad. This is the, this is the full judgment and, and justice of God uh, being demonstrated against a sinful earth. And I think our takeaway point from this should be, wow. Things are really bad. We really have fallen short. We really have sinned against God. Thank the Lord that we have Jesus to forgive us our sins, to win our salvation, because we can't stand up against this type of a judgment. Uh, and so that is a, an, an encouragement in a roundabout sense, uh, that we have a Savior who loves us, that we're not uh, included in the, a permanent judgment uh, of God, uh, but that we're actually spared from that by Jesus Christ. And so that's what we should keep in mind as we're reading these kind of scary passages. Uh, now we'll go on into to verse uh, chapter 9. I want to try and finish the trumpets. Uh, chapter 9, verse 1, in the fifth trumpet, uh, fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Uh, he opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun of the air and the air were darkened with smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Uh, in appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. All right. Um, this is, again, a passage of great, great confusion. Uh, so there's an angel that goes down and... and opens this bottomless pit. And again, this is oftentimes, this is the imagery then where people in the Middle Ages said, well, hell is like a hole in the, the earth and you go in there. But that doesn't work either because it says that it's a bottomless pit. And we know that every physical mass has a bottom, right? You know, there, there's a limit to, to the created world. Uh, so that doesn't work if you're going to be hyper literal uh, on that. Uh, and then locusts come out of the smoke of the earth. But the locusts are like scorpions, but then the description of them doesn't even sound like scorpions because they have human faces, uh, but then they have horses, they look like horses, and there's wings and tails and... I don't know. If you understand what this means, good for you. Uh, but I hope I never meet one of these things. It sounds bad, right? Uh, and I want you to imagine again, I, I know I've said this before, but imagine if John in the first century has to describe, I don't know, drone, drone strikes in Syria. How is he going to describe that, right? He sees this thing and it looks like metal and it's flying over and it bombs uh, a hospital or something like, like, how is he going to describe that? What language is he going to use to describe something that's beyond his understanding, right? If John gets a vision of a Petri dish with the coronavirus spreading and, and destroying cells, how is he going to describe that in a way that people from the first century 
to the end of the world are going to understand that. He's going to use symbolism, I think. Uh, and so I don't know what all of this means, but it's bad. Uh, it's really bad. There's a lot of suffering uh, that's going to be at the end of, of the age. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very dramatic. And again, we get, uh, Pastor, do your job. Uh, Hebrew and Greek, what does Abaddon, what does Apollyon mean? Uh, it just means the destroyer. Uh, it's it's the one who just looses destruction. It's it's actually like the verb to untie. Uh, so it's like you have this thing that's tied together, this, this working world, and it's just undone. And that's really what we're seeing here, that it is just... Uh, that, that is the world being kind of undone. Now, I'm going to go on just a little bit further. The first, uh, verse 12. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel, who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops were was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates of the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads. And fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed, by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths, for the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they, they wound. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands nor give up worshipping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Uh, so we get this image here, a third of mankind being killed by plague. Uh, now, we've been pretty scared with the coronavirus, uh, and, you know, it hasn't even come close to, to killing a third of humanity. Can you imagine a third of humanity, over two billion people dead uh, from something? Like, that's unfathomable. Uh, I can't even imagine. And so that's the type of plagues. And I mean, we've had plagues that have, have done terrible stuff like that before. I think smallpox, what did they say? It wiped out over 90% of the native populations of North America. Uh, so we've seen horrifying plagues before. Uh, and it's weird to think in our plague year, in our year of coronavirus, uh, that there's actually worse things that could come. Uh, and so we often, again, we often have this understanding uh, that everything in life is going to be hunky-dory and okay. Uh, and I don't think that's what we're promised. I think what we're promised is heaven, where things will be okay. We're promised the resurrection uh, because of Christ, because of his grace towards us and the forgiveness he won for us on the cross. Uh, and we can share in that glory of heaven, but our lives on earth will be a, a difficult time. And, and the lives of these people uh, in this, these last days will be really horrifying. And I, I can't even imagine, I really hope uh, that I'm not in this, this last generation uh, or, or experience anything like what's described here because it's just horrifying. Uh, it's beyond comprehension. And so again, it's the sense of uh, there is judgment, there is justice, there is wrath. And I think the comfort for us is when we look around, uh, we can know that we're not exceptionally hated or judged or, or uh, attacked, uh, but that this is the lot of human suffering in the world and that we are a part of this human race. And this is the honesty of God in telling us uh, the way that the world is going to be like, the way things are going to happen. The last thing I'll just emphasize here is it says uh, that even after all this judgment, even after all this, people didn't give up worshiping demons and idols and you know chasing after things that weren't God uh, and so that doesn't change about humans right uh, and so it's sometimes asked you know why does God have to bring judgment why does he have to to destroy people why do people have to die before they go to heaven and I think what's interesting we see again and again in the Bible it doesn't seem to matter what the program what the regimen what the routine is that God sends to make humans better they never end up better 
even when you know he, he floods the world and he's down to Noah and his family, he looks at Noah and his family and he sees evil in their hearts. Uh, and so the idea is until you have a whole wipe of the system, until you experience uh, a total cleansing, a total purification, uh, there can't be new life in the truest sense. And I think that's the, the idea that we're getting out of Revelation. Uh, please be encouraged. Please maybe read in your Bibles another passage that's more encouraging afterwards, because I know Revelation can be dark uh, and it can be tough, but we're, we're making our way through and it ends in heaven. Uh, that's my, my encouragement, my selling point for Revelation. So uh, this week, may God bless you and keep you in the promise of our Savior Jesus Christ, who will return and rescue us. God's peace.